Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Resolution Foundation event. Uh, we're going to be learning some lessons from economic history tonight. Um, I'm Gavin Kelly. I'm the chair of the Resolution Foundation. Very warm welcome to all of you uh, who've come in, in in real life, as you say, and a warm welcome to uh, lots of you online who I know have got good numbers online tonight too, so uh, welcome to all of you. This event is part of a uh, um, econo Economy 2030 project, which is a big the kind of grand project that we're running at the Resolution Foundation jointly with our friends at the LSC, Centre for Economic Performance. Um, it's a major inquiry trying to look right across the the kind of the, the waterfront, if you like, of economic and social policy, asking the big questions about the future of the British economic model uh, as we look to 2030 and beyond, particularly in light of the major shocks and sort of drivers of change of the 2020s which I don't need to list through you because we're all living through them, but there are many of them, and they are asking very difficult questions about um, for, uh, for policymakers. So we're trying to inform that. We'll be, we've published a major report. We've published about 30 reports in total, but we published a kind of interim report this summer called Stagnation Nation, which was a kind of staging post bringing together all analysis to date, um, and we are going to be publishing a final report uh, roughly a year from now to hopefully shape much of the policy debate ahead of a general election, uh, sometime not too long after then, probably. So that's, that's how this fits in. This discussion tonight um, marks the publication of uh, two papers, which we're going to be hearing about, uh, about the UK and its economic history that we want to learn from as we look to sort of think about how we should approach some of the big structural ch challenges of our times. Um, now, I should say, we, th we thought, we, we, when we realised that the government and the Treasury were silly enough to, to, to choose to hold a budget on the same day as our events, <laughs> and our date was set before theirs, I hasten to add, we did think about postponing it. Um, and then we thought, well, partly we thought about the diaries of our speakers, and that filled us with horror, but we also thought <laughs> that long after all the numbers that people are going to be writing about tonight and tomorrow morning, including all of my colleagues upstairs in the Resolution Foundation. All, long after those numbers get, all get revised and changed and more money gets found for public spending and black holes suddenly changed in size and so on, um, the issues that we're talking about tonight in terms of how to manage periods of disruptive economic change and lessons from our past, those issues will still be, uh, will be with us and be very relevant. So we thought we would... Um, take a longer view and stick with our plan, as they say. Um, so the papers we're talking about tonight are by Nick Crafts and by John Muirbaud, who's written jointly with David Soskies. Um, and they are the first two papers we're publishing as part of this 2030 uh, project, which are particularly kind of a, a strand of that project is about learning the lessons from other nations who, uh, in terms of their episodes of, of managing economic change, but also learning lessons from a from our own past. Uh, and I should say that today we also published uh, two other pieces, one on, uh, if you like, the warning signs from Italy's long-term stagnation, and another piece on the kind of trajectory of the, uh, Estonia's economy post, it, post the dissolution of the USSR, and in it kind of going, along, going alone and having to form new trading relations, both of which are on our website. They're fascinating. We launched them at the the Festival of Economics in Bristol earlier today, part one of, part of Diane's sort of, uh, one of your many hats uh, is, is curating that. And I'm co-editing all of these pieces with um, uh, Richard Davis, who's an economist at the University of Bristol, so I should give him a plug too. And we've got many more pieces coming in the months ahead that we'll be publishing. Um, now, it's, we're not just looking at the econo at kind of economic history because we're curious about the past, we're looking at it because we want to try and bring, I guess, a historic perspective to bear on some of the questions that we face today. And we do that, I mean, I spent uh, quite a long time in Whitehall and working in the Treasury and elsewhere, and I, I was just so struck by the lack of institutional memory going back 10 years, never mind we'll be talking about going back a century, but it did feel like people were having many conversations for the first time, even though it was obvious that different versions of those conversations have been happening many, many, uh, many times over previous decades. So I think it's really important that we here and our work with the LSE don't fall into that trap and that we are not either ahistorical or parochial in our outlook. Many of the challenges, some of the challenges the UK faces, we've managed to create entirely for ourselves uniquely, but many of the challenges we face um, are shared with other places and we've got lots we can learn from other countries. So we plan to do that. <coughs> 
Um, that is enough by way of introduction for me, I think. I just, let me just say a word about our speakers and then how we're going to do this. So first up, we're going to, you know these people, I think most of you are probably friends with these people, as far as I can tell from looking around the room. Possibly uh, enemies. Or possibly enemies. <laughs> probably, for, and former pupils and goodness knows what else. And it's great to see people here who have lived and shaped some of the debates we'll be talking about. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from people in the room uh, in, in our discussion. But first up, we're going to hear from Nick Crafts. Uh, as you know, he's an uh, economic history professor at University of Sussex. He's done all sorts of other things and written, if you don't know what Nick's written, you should do. He's written more about l the long view of productivity growth and economic growth in the UK than almost anyone, I think. Then we're going to hear from John Muehlbauer, who's professor of economics at Nuffield College, Oxford, and a senior fellow at INET there. And again, John will be well known to you, but I, I've always looked to John to learn about the kind of interaction, I guess, between housing finance and the kind of wider macro and real economy, but he's written about all sorts of things. And then we're going to hear from Diane Coyle, um, who is Professor of Public Policy at Cambridge and runs uh, the Bennett Institute there, who has written all sorts of things too, not least productivity, technology, and so on. After we've heard from them, we're going to open it up. Uh, you know the drill if you're online. We use slido.com. Uh, give us your questions. We'll take questions in the room two um, and I will try and get us done on time or thereabouts to release you to your evening. So that is what we're doing. We may even bring in a poll if we have time, who knows. Uh, but with no more ado from me, I am going to hand over to you, Nick, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, the the title of my piece is Adapting Well to New Circumstances, with a question mark, uh, UK Experience in Changing Times. Uh, my brief was to look at how we coped with uh, past transitions with regard to the impact on productivity performance, but also with an eye to uh, what the adjustment costs were in that. In the paper, I, I've looked at five different episodes. I've got only a few minutes this evening, so I'm going to uh, confine myself just to two of them. Uh, so the first of those is perhaps the most obvious one, starting place, uh, namely the Great Depression of the 1930s. Um, I think a lot of people don't actually perceive that very clearly. Let me say what I think happened. Uh, I think we had a nasty shock, a severe recession, but not actually a depression in the early 30s. After that, we had a strong recovery. We had probably four years of growth at over 4%, 1933 to 37. Macroeconomic policy, in a sense, performed very well, despite the strictures of Keynes. Um, monetary policy was very supportive, leaving the gold standard was forced, but just the right thing to do. Uh, policies to reduce real interest rates were basically, I think, successful. We have research to show that. And just again, for the person in the pub, it wasn't rearmament which drove this, although rearmament did ask, add uh, an element after 1935. But, there's always a but, isn't there? I think there were two really big downsides uh, of this, or, or two aspects which we should worry about, be critical about. The first is the implications of the recovery strategy uh, for the supply side, for supply side policy, and in particular for competition in the economy. The policymakers um, sort of several decades early, had clearly absorbed the message of Gauti Egertsen. When in a crisis, do anything to raise prices and increase inflationary expectations when you're at the zero lower bound. Uh, our government took that pretty seriously, I think. And amongst other things, they uh, added uh, protectionism. We moved away from free trade and they encouraged cartels. Uh, there was even a policy to give tax breaks to cartels at one point, which never quite saw the light of day, but was apparently discussed. That change in competition, I think, had a severe effect in impairing uh, productivity performance over several decades from that point. 
took about four decades completely to get rid of these uh, changes from the 1930s. Uh, we're only unwinding the protectionism in the late 60s and early 70s. Competition policy for most of the early po post-war decades is, uh, I think, very weak. The second big downside, I think, is the reason people do probably think of this as a depression, namely that we had a big problem solving unemployment. Unemployment in the regions, unemployment in what at the time, you'll forgive the phrase, they called Outer Britain. Uh, even in 1937, at the peak of this boom, 23% uh, of insured workers were unemployed in Wales. Um, there were embryonic attempts at regional policy, but essentially the restructuring of the economy towards home demand and away from uh, exports and managing the decline of old industries uh, left really, I think, major adjustment costs. Uh, we didn't get to grips with that in the uh, interwar period. And the fallout from that, I think, was a loss of faith in the market economy and some of the policies used after World War II. So that brings me on to saying, what about um, the transition from war to peace after World War II? That's going to be my second episode. Um, I'm noticing quite a lot of people telling me that there are lots of good lessons to learn from the 1940s. Uh, I believe the, the leader of the Labour Party had said something to that effect in a, a flagship speech not so long ago. I think many of the lessons of the 1940s are don't do it like they did, uh, I'm afraid. And that's not what people usually uh, think they're going to hear. Some things were done very well. The transition from war to peace in terms of short-term macro avoided massive inflation or unemployment. The balance of payments problem was alleviated over several years. And to everyone's pleasure, the National Health Service was established. At the same time, I think there were problems here and quite big ones. While short term macro looks all right in a sense, I think it was generally a, a pursued at the expense of long-term productivity growth. Let me tell you the main line of argument I have in mind here. After the trauma of the interwar period, it became an imperative politically to aim for very low unemployment. Very low unemployment in the policymakers' minds implied the need for wage restraint on the part of organised labour. How do we get wage restraint? By designing policies which organised labour would like. We talk about, uh, later on when we get to the Thatcher period, some people talk about ending the trade union veto on supply-side policy. That's a bit hyperbolic, but you, you get the general idea. So I won't rehearse the long list of things which were wrong, but it does seem to me that supply-side policy in the sense of uh, its impact on productivity growth was very badly designed and partly for the reason that I've just explained. Uh, so look at tax policy, look at protectionism, uh, look at innovation policy, look at infrastructure policy. We've got a long list of things which just were not done uh, very well. The second thing that I would want to stress about the uh, post-World War II period is that the beverage report, it wasn't exactly implemented, but the welfare state is essentially beverages plan, social security, that wasn't very well implemented either. And he's exactly not the sort of blueprint for a modern welfare state. Beveridge promised, I'll use the phrases, adequacy of benefit was his phrase, an end to means testing and the provision of social insurance. The Beveridge Report, or its implementation by the post-war government, achieved none of those. 13% of the population were in poverty in the early 1950s, on the best measure we've got. Um, benefits were clearly below Beveridge's own poverty line. Means testing carried on, and the number of people on national assistance and then supplementary benefit, means tested benefits, went up over time. 
And social insurance to me, with my economist's hat on, means the state providing insurance for risks which the private sector can't insure. In other words, it's dealing with a market failure. You might think COVID would be an example of that recently. Beverage is flat rate benefits and contributions got nowhere near that. Because the social protection it offered was so poor to people losing their human capital, the onus is put on protecting jobs, not workers. Exactly the wrong way around. Okay, just one final uh, segment. Um, the whole purpose of this is to think about policy implications for today. I want to draw you out of the past. Yeah, so let me just venture something. This is dangerous territory for a proper historians of, story. often hate it. Even the 1980s is awfully bit, close bit to today. Yeah. Um, but thinking uh, about this, the brief, in a sense, for this project was we're going through a decade of severe change. If we are going back to faster growth, it seems to me it will rely on much better, much stronger technological progress. What might that technological progress be? Well, it might partly be the green economy, but it will probably also be something like AI, robotics, and so on. I would see that technological progress as likely to be disruptive and once again leaving this issue of can you do it without having large adjustment costs. I think this is a rather pressing issue at the minute because I see young people sort of losing faith in the market economy and probably not liking the creative destruction which is at the heart of that vision. That suggests to me we need a rather different style of welfare state. Uh, I think I've run out of time. So come, let come finish up, finish up, explore, ex just expand on what you mean by a different type of welfare state. Well, I think our arrangement should essentially be low or almost no employment protection plus proper social insurance, and that must include uh, a strong element of earnings related yeah. benefits, plus very strong, vigorous, active labour market policies. You want Denmark? Uh, <laughs> you've taken my next sentence. Oh, you, you, you rude man. <laughs> yeah, I'm suggesting that we probably should be thinking about a British version yeah. of flex security. Great. Well, you have ventured out of the past and given us... Uh, I'm going to pointers. retreat into my shell now. Thank you very much, Nick. Excellent. Um, let's uh, move straight on to, uh, we're going to kind of leap forward a few decades. We're going to get up to the 80s uh, with John Muehlbaum. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, it's dangerous territory, as, as Nick says, particularly for an, an economist who's not a historian, but uh, was a participant observer. Um, right. So. To start the story of the 80s, we have to start with the legacy of the 70s. So in terms of education, training, um, both for management and workers, uh, the UK was doing rather badly compared to other countries. And then we had the, the barber boom and the oil shock, um, which drove up inflation to close to 27% on the RPI measure in, in August 75. And that made already fractious industrial relations uh, much worse. Then we have many union leaders and managers really not understanding the economics of a small open economy. They thought um, government bailouts would be possible. Um, the decade ended with the ignominy of the winter of discontent, which of course opened the door to Mrs. Thatcher. Now, the, the one big advantage the UK had was North Sea oil and gas. And Harold Wilson observed there was a macabre game, game of musical chairs um, going on between the parties in the hope of being in possession of the chair when the oil really began to flow. Uh, so that's a very important part of, the, of that decade. Um, of course, it was a period of, of um, really dramatic changes in, in long-run trends, um, sh global shifts in employment and output from industry to services, the globalization of trade and finance um, going on, um, then the oil price shock of 1980, and then the rise in US interest rates under Reagan because of 
macroeconomic policies in the, in the US with, with global implications. So in 79, Mr. Thatcher is elected. Um, and what happened then? Well, um, this is a rather heavy slide, but uh, a lot of things happened. Um, first of all, there was the monetarist policy. Uh, the delusion that money growth drives inflation, despite the empirical evidence, allowing money growth then to set interest rate policy and a pro-cyclical medium-term financial strategy. In 79, um, in already a high inflation period, uh, they raised VAT from 8% to 15%, the biggest sudden increase in indirect taxation ever. In 81, the budget tightened fiscal policy in what was a deep recession. Output had fallen by three, three and a bit percent. Um, now, in the paper, we look at this. Is it an example of the expansionary effect of fiscal contraction? Because there was a moderate expansion afterwards, a moderate recovery afterwards. And we conclude after a detailed look, um, no. Um, part of the reason why the economy recovered was financial liberalization. The removal of exchange controls of the corset that limited what banks could do opened the doors for banks to enter the mortgage market and then that led to the loosening of regulations for building societies. So that's the initial period, the first Thatcher government. So from 83 onwards, we have a resumption of growth, tax and privatization receipts are coming in, demography is very favorable, so public finances improve. With pro-cyclical fiscal policy, then you have tax cuts from 86, which exacerbated what was already a boom that was beginning, um, a house price and, and credit boom. Uh, the 86 oil price fall was like an indirect tax cut. Um, that also fed that boom. And then in October 87, there was the flash crash in the stock market, um, which led to a big cut in interest rates that fueled demand further. And then Mrs. Thatcher wanted to get rid of the domestic rates, uh, wanted to bring in her poll tax. And obviously when you shift, when you abolish property tax at the height of a boom, you, you just make the boom a lot worse. So the economy was heavily overheating, consumption was growing much more rapidly than income. Base rates then had to be hiked from 7.5% to 15% from 88 to 89 in, res in response to rising inflation and balance of payments deficits. Then, of course, we have a recession. House prices fell four years in a row. Mortgage arrears and foreclosures rose to all-time highs. And then given the pressures of high interest rates in the ERM, the overvalued exchange rate, partly because of, of inflation being higher in the UK than elsewhere, and a severe domestic recession, of course, the UK had to leave the ERM. A very humiliating exit. Um, Let's look at some of the consequences of, uh, of these policies. Um, well, unemployment rocketed 5.4% to 11.8% and stayed high for a very long time. Um, employment in manufacturing from 79 to 93 fell by 39%. And as you can see from the chart, deindustrialization was quite a lot worse. The, the heavy blue line is, is the UK quite a lot worse in the UK than, than other countries. And then we have Thatcher policies on housing. Um, part of the agenda of creating a property-earning democracy. Um, in fact, in 1979, 55% of, of households were property owners. That rose to 72% in 2001. And much of that had to do with right to buy sales. Um, which demolished much of the affordable social housing sector uh, without replacement. And you can see the big drop in, in new builds um, in that period. Um, and of course, when you don't expand um, housing supply and the economy incomes grow, then house prices rise and a lot of the out the Higher rise in the house price to income ratio relative to other countries. Uh, the UK is the champion of the G7, uh, is due to that. And that leads to a rise in social exclusion and intergenerational inequality, where the Res Resolution Foundation, of course, has done absolutely fantastic, fantastic work.
Um, one of the other legacies of the Thatcher period um, is the son of poll tax, namely the council tax. Um, the council tax is a bit of a monster. When one explains it to visitors from other countries, they can't believe that a civilized country has a, a system like this where poorer people, people living in, in, in low value properties, pay very high tax rates as a fraction of value, and people in the most expensive properties pay very little. And that's also regionally regressive. So, you know, think about leveling up. Why do you charge um, so much higher tax rates in the poorest regions? And another consequence of the Thatcher period was that it's exactly in this period that um, household income inequality um, rises seemingly permanently. There's a level shift from the pre-Thatcher period to the post-Thatcher period, and in particular after housing costs. Also, rises in between inequality between regions and between generations. There were almost no policies to help the left behind locations, no northern powerhouse, for example. Um, labor market skills and education, big story there. Um, David Soska is my co-author, who unfortunately is not here, um, has uh, done some outstanding work in this area. So uh, labor market flexibility, of course, was a big issue for, for Mrs. Thatcher, shifting the balance of power to, employ to employers, uh, greater wage inequality, flexible labor market, all part of the story. So although employment levels were comparatively high compared to other countries, although at the moment, of course, post-COVID, that's not the case, uh, the UK has a, a swathe of low wage, skill and low progression service sector jobs with poor lab labor standards. Um, that remains one of the legacies of the period. Um, David argues that a fundamental failure of the whole period was the lack of an effective education and training system to complement the, uh, the new flexible market. Um, he also makes the point that in countries where apprenticeships um, are better organized, even there, employers favor hiring from second level university systems, um, the tertiary B college systems, and he makes the point that in nearly all advanced economies, apart from the UK, there are very important uh, systems of this kind. And um, UK universities teach in a very specialized way. They produce students with limited management skills, software understanding, and so on. And that all of that is part of the limitation on innovation and the, the movement from education to, to productivity. In terms of financial regulation, land use, and property taxation, which is something I've been concerned with for <laughs> very many years, um, there's a long shadow of the 1980s uh, that, that still hangs over the economy. <coughs> it helps explain the UK's low saving and investment rates. We've had a continuous balance of payment deficits since 1984. And one of the implications of that, of course, is that an increasingly large share of UK assets are under foreign control foreign ownership, and the, the profits go abroad. They don't come back to, to finance the UK economy. Um, <clears throat> in the paper, um, I mention a spate of recent international studies that confirm the crowding out of more productive investment during credit fueled real estate booms. There's now really about six or seven quite rigorous papers um, on this. And uh, it uh, is very important for the UK. Um, so the, the benefits of growth in the UK have disproportionately accumulated to landowners and to the financial sector. And I would argue that the diversion of entrepreneurship into rent seeking and overcoming land constraints is part of the problem that we suffer from. Um, and of course, the global financial crisis and the debt burden that comes from bailing out the banks um, are part of, the, part of the reason why we have um, high government debt. So let's turn to the future, learning some lessons. One important lesson, which of course the recent List Trust episode um, illustrates very well, is to avoid chaotic pro-cyclical ideology driven macro policies. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I think a comprehensive reform program that 
is focused on growth has to start with a primary fiscal rule that focuses on the net asset position of the government rather than gross debt. I mean, it seems to be quite shocking that in 12 years, when real interest rates have been close to zero, the government has not invested in the infrastructure and the many other training of doctors, the many things that where there were higher potential returns. So the, the 61 Land Compensation Act gave landowners really quite extraordinary privileges, and that needs to be repealed to empower land value capture to fund infrastructure and affordable housing and relax some of the constraints on economic activity. Replacement of the unfair council tax with um, a property tax with green discounts for low carbon and buildings and gardens, I think is important and would put right one of the, one of the worst legacies of the 1980s. It would help power a green transition. And interestingly enough, um, a green transition has the potential of really helping the left behind places. Because when you look at where the locations are for hydrogen, wind power, um, and so on, um, it's very often in, in, in some of the poorest places in the country. And finally, um, turning to um, expanding on this question of, of taxation. Taxing land, we know as economists, has the least distorting effect on econo economic activity. It reduces social exclusion, intergenerational injustice, regional inequality, and financial instability. Particularly, the taxes are linked to current market values. If it broadened the tax base, and that would help to resolve the current fiscal crisis. And then, the UK, as Gavin has been saying, um, has a comparative advantage in high value uh, high value service industries, um, knowledge and software intensive. And so we need some educational reforms, um, the tertiary B college system in particular. And then, of course, we have two of Mrs. Thatcher's finest achievements, the European single market and the university expansion uh, are both severely damaged by Boris-type Brexit, uh, which has re-erected the barriers that Mrs. Thatcher was so keen to remove. Uh, UK universities, for all their quality, face um, new handicaps, especially in science. So Brexit damage limitation needs to be a high priority. So these are some of the directions, some of the things we can learn from the legacy of the past and the failures of the past that, um, that I draw out. Thank you very much, John. You. Um, and before we turn to Dan, let me just say, um, Nick and John have both done a great job in basically keeping to our stringent time limits. Um, their reports are, are rich in detail and they kind of take you through various episodes and do try and bring, bring out uh, lessons for today and tomorrow. So um, do look at them. There's printed copies upstairs, they're online. Please do, do have a read. That's well worth your time. Uh, Diane, you've got the fun job of responding to about a century and a half of economic yeah. history and what it means for today in about seven minutes or something. So um, over to you before we take it forward. Thank you. Well, it's a privilege to respond to these two papers. I do commend them to you if you've not had a chance to read them yet. Actually, John's talk took me back to my first job in the Treasury in the days of monetarism in the mid-1980s. And I, my task was to find the linear combination of deposits that minimised the growth rate. So <laughs> my claim to fame is having invi invented what became M4 <coughs> through that task. Um, so I thought I'd introduce a little bit of reflection on today's budget, or whatever we're calling it as well. And the litmus test for me um, about whether this government was serious about a pro-growth agenda was, would they fund Northern Powerhouse Rail? And it's a a mixed signal. They're going to fund core Northern Powerhouse Rail. It's not clear what that means. But why is this my litmus test? It's because um, if we want to take this opportunity to connect those northern cities in a single labour market with an effective, seamless public transport system of the kind that London and its hinterland have, where there are opportunities for uh, couples to have professional careers in the region where there's more affordable housing and a lot of vibrant centres that you could base yourself in. That would be a serious signal of intent to enable a growth pole in the economy in addition to um, uh, London and the South East. Now I'm also from the North West so there's, there's you know, 
that kind of interest here as well. I've been long involved with Greater Manchester. But productivity and growth in the UK mean around the whole of the country, not just in one part of it. And around the whole of the country, if you, if you um, travel around, the infrastructure, the services are clearly inadequate and we're clearly a poor country. That's what we are. Um, and as John said, we've had zero real interest rates for a while. What a shame that opportunity wasn't taken. And we've also had kind of favourable politics towards this rebalancing of growth. Um, I, I'm not keen on the word rebalancing because it implies taking away from London. Nobody wants that. But, you know, having some growth outside one part of the country um, because of the pledges in the manifesto, which Rishi Sunak is taking as his mandate and because of, of the whole red wall politics. Um, so what we have today, I think, does focus on supply side policies, on um, productivity growth. And it's better than the cut taxes to grow retro Thatcherism we had for the previous government a little while ago. Um, but it's not adequate. And the things that are being tried have been tried before and they haven't worked. So this litany of long term weaknesses that we've heard from Nick and John, um, they're really familiar, aren't they? The infrastructure is inadequate. Uh, land use um, doesn't happen effectively. We don't have an adequate housing supply. People are stuck where they are because we can't build any more houses. We've had underinvestment across the board, including in R&D. You know, in what world is it an ambitious target to get to the OECD average from last year, several years from now? It's not enough. Education, it's been divisive. It's been a political football. Why is Secretaries of State getting involved in the right way of teaching phonics? Um, universities a great strong sector of the economy being forced into a business model such that educating British undergraduates is loss making for them and this, uh, this sort of cultural attacks on taking us out of Erasmus and so on. Under investment in health, great health foundation report out today about how much we've under invested in people's health which affects productivity. Weakness in finance for growing companies. So these are all really familiar and nothing has been done about them. So if you ask what links them it's really the deep, deep economic institutions of the UK. And you can see that a system, the system is generating what it was set up to do, which is deliver structural advantages to the South and <coughs> East, to the rich and privileged, and to private sector employers, which has been justified since Mrs Thatcher's time by a very deep-seated belief in markets and um, what you might call the Treasury view, that state action is usually undesirable and public spending should always be resisted. Um, so you get this combination of mistaking markets for business and um, having weak competition policy, as, as Nick spoke about. In fact, it, just exactly a year ago, I went to a, an event at the Institute of Economic Affairs down the road about competition in digital markets, on which I've done some work. And Chris Philp, who was a minister in DCMS at the time, said, much as my free market instincts make me want to turn a blind eye to monopolies, there has to be something done about digital big tech companies. So, um, you know, an inadequate framework for the market to operate combined with suspicion of state activity and therefore the worst of all possible worlds. So what would a genuine Thatcherite programme look like now? A, a radical, productivity-oriented series of reforms. We might build some council housing, we'd certainly reform council tax, uh, we'd enable land capture, land value capture for, for the public good, repeal this 1961 Act that John described. Um, I learned from the paper that there are um, only 6,000 landowners own about two thirds of the land in the UK. So if you're only going to lose 6,000 votes, what's the problem? Um, end the tax privilege of private schools, um, reform HE and education funding, invest in early years in deprived areas, uh, enable um, adequate investment in R&D and public infrastructure because you need the public sector where the payback period is going to be longer than any private sector investor can manage and where a lot of the return might not anyway be appropriate by private investor. Bias that towards out of London. Devolve some powers and some tax and spending powers. There'd certainly be uneven results, but could it be worse than we have now? What does genuine social insurance look like in an era of the kind of shocks that we've been having? Uh, we've got an economy where about a quarter of the people um, have no assets and are going to have no adequate pension when they retire. What do they need? Um, maybe it's flex security. I would add into that um, 
public services and infrastructure because they are very redistributive as well and enable people, um, open opportunities to people. I think the basic point where I want to end is that the Treasury and the way of thinking in policy, the policy world about the economy is actually pretty good at emergencies. I think we've got through mm. the financial crisis and the pandemic better than we might um, have, have feared at some stages. But there's no strategic thinking in the economic policy framework, either in the politics or actually in the core institutions. So we're in an environment where the digital transformation is underway, we need it to happen, we need the automation, we need the robots to have productivity growth. So there will be those shocks. We need the energy transition. These are major, major structural transformations in the production side of the economy that have to happen. We're moving into an economy where there are more externalities, there are more <coughs> spillovers, it's knowledge-based, so we need people, that's what goes on in people's heads, we need the education. But I think above all, we need to develop a more strategic approach to our economic institutions. And that I think probably does need that kind of political leadership, um, you know, a, a Mrs. Thatcher for the 21st century. And I'm going to stop That's there. A note to finish on. Um, I think we should give them all actually a round of applause before we turn to questions. Um, so thank you for that, Diane. And we're actually going to, can we bring up the poll? We sort of, we have, we, we do engage people with a poll. And this, um, this may sound a bit frivolous, but there is something behind it. And that is, when we look back at this decade, I guess when future historians like Nick look back at this decade, what, what other decade from our recent past do you think will be the best point of comparison? And I guess behind this is sort of, is it the 70s with a massive terms of trade shock and high inflation? Is it an 80s type decade with a lot of reallocation, whether because of digital or AI? or net zero, but a lot of reallocation within the economy leading to um, some, real, some growth, but also some highly concentrated areas of disadvantage. Or is it sort of less obviously, but um, possibly like a 90s style decade, uh, which has got a horrible start, a massive loss of international credibility um, uh, in terms of our economic framework, but actually ends up rather better than many people thought as a strong decade, in part because some productivity gains come through in the 90s, ICT sort of revolution. This, this decade it may be, you know, clean energy being sort of surprising on the upside or AI eventually showing in the numbers or whatever it is, but it could be a better decade than people think. Or none of the above is obviously probably always the safest bet. But um, give us your views on that at slido.com. Um, we'll see, uh, we'll get your, we'll take your temperature on how you think this decade will be viewed. Now, um, we've had a range of, of questions coming in, and I'm not going to read them all out, um, but I am going to bounce off them a bit. Um, and one of them, and, and Diane, you kind of sort of channeled this a bit, one of the, one of the themes coming through is, I guess, the, the kind of haunting familiarity of some of the discussion in that, um, so, I mean, your paper talks about the kind of l the long-term problem of short-termism in this country, uh, which goes back, there's different sort of versions of, but goes back a long way. Uh, the long-term problem of regional inequality and concentrations of economic advantage and disadvantage, which are very familiar and haven't changed that much over time. Um, we've had, you know, through my whole career, there has always been a, this is the time we have to focus on vocational education and taking it much more seriously. It's been basically the same, a similar sort of conversation for for, for three decades and probably many more, I could go on. Um, so I guess the question there is kind of to what extent are we prisoners of our past? Is it, are there, do we have kind of path dependent shortcomings as well as some deep advantages which are fairly consistent too in terms of some of the things that we're good at as a country and it's just really hard to change them and people kind of tweak here and there but basically we are kind of who we are or is that just a kind of pessimistic view of the capacity and the discretion of policymakers to shake things up for the better? Um, but I think that's a kind of that that hangs over a lot of this discussion. So I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to I'm gonna get you all to engage with that. But Nick, I'll start with you because it kind of comes straight out of your paper in a way. Well, it does, except that I did rather steer away from the explicit notion of path dependence in it, in its strict sense. I, I do think that history matters. I do think that history constrains policy uh, choices at various times. Though I think the constraints have been somewhat different. 
Uh, they're gr rooted to some extent in uh, the recent past and the electorate's um, take on the recent past, yep. uh, for example, and that does change over time. It clearly is possible to have a maverick prime minister who changes uh, quite a lot. Mrs Thatcher was surely uh, that. That said, she would probably have been deposed uh, by her own party uh, had it not been for the Labour Party's incompetence and the Argentinians' um, invasion mm. of the Malvinas. Mm. It helps when the opposition party splits in two. It does <laughs> indeed, yeah. yeah. But I recall actually being in Oxford at that time, visiting Nuffield even, John, and the fellow's betting book, I think, had the longest she'd stay in office being about six months from the date I was there. <laughs> it was a common belief that she would not survive. So uh, radicalism is possible, but I think is actually quite uh, difficult. Um, I think what uh, my paper says is that Nevertheless, political discretion uh, can be exercised, but needs to some extent to be controlled. Mm. So what strikes me in the context of short-termism is that we really don't have any equivalent to the OBR or the Bank of England or whatever looking at supply-side policy and holding government to account at least in the sense of being able to uh, instigate investigations, command evidence, yep. report, and say to government, comply or explain, or something like that. So, uh, I mean, I'm not sure there's a perfect model anywhere in the world, but I think an improvement on what we've got at the moment would be the Australian uh, Productivity, Productivity Commission. Mm. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, Dan, I'll come to you next on this kind of... Is that just a pessimistic frame that basically the, has, the past hangs so heavily and we, you know, it's hard to do much about it? I'm a bit more optimistic than that. Um, well, a bit of both. The, the pessimistic bit is that we have extraordinary policy churn. This is something I've done some work on recently. Um, uh, for example, applying um, natural language processing techniques to the documents published within the 12 month period by the Boris Johnson government. They published two major economic strategies and we looked at the key phrases from those strategies and we searched all the other policy documents published by the government in the following 12 months to look for continuity. Yeah. This is textual continuity. None. The only thing that crops up in everything is, is AI. <laughs> um, but that takes me on to my more optimistic point, which is I think new technologies are an opportunity to shift, to shift things, both locationally, um, in terms of investment and skills and, and the possibility of growth happening and these are major technological shifts and I know we're not seeing productivity benefits it's not because there are not innovations going on it's because there are innovations not being used so if you can unlock a bit of that that would make me a little bit more yeah. optimistic. Yeah. Uh, John over to you. Yeah past dependence I think is hugely important um, not least because of the political economy. Um, you know having brought about the property only democracy, um, aligned the interests of many ordinary voters with those of the, the extremely wealthy landowners um, who like to have house price inflation continuing um, forever. Um, empowering the, uh, the city, you know, the city became hugely powerful. Uh, the lobbying power of the city um, is, is absolutely vast. And of course, that, that's part of the reason why we had loose financial regulation. Our loose financial regulation, uh, which is bipartisan, really, one can't blame Labour entirely, um, is part of the reason why the regulators in other parts of the world couldn't regulate more successfully before the financial crisis. So you know, the UK actually, in my view, and quite a few people think this, um, external observers think that, that we are part of the reason why the global financial crisis happened. Um, and, you know, because we've run the balance of payments deficit now since 1984, um, we have, you know, quite a weak underlying position in, in, in real resources, control of resources, so we have to rely on foreigners, um, on the kindness of strangers to, to finance our, our excess consumption. We consume more than we <coughs> produce. Um, and um, that makes us quite vulnerable also in terms of political economy because it's then difficult to have um, tax policies that, that discourage foreign investors um, 
you know, who, whose interests you tend to coincide with, with those of the city and, uh, and the wealthiest. Um, so we are stuck um, quite seriously in, in, a, in, a, in a deep hole, in my view. And of course, Brexit, which hardly ever gets mentioned, um, has made, has caused a shift, a downshift in, in, in the real um, in the real ability of the economy to, to produce um, a, a very significant amount. I think you'll find it gets mentioned more and more, actually. It's, it's the, the opposite of the upshift we got yeah. between the mid-70s and the mid-80s. Yes, yes. Now, there's lots of questions coming in and slightly, but there's a lot of wisdom in this room as well. So I want to invite any questions that we have. Unless you're all going to be shy, I've got loads. But um, do we have anyone here who wants to ask anything. So we've got gentlemen in the front. And any others to come? Yeah, okay. So let's, we've got this gentleman. Is it Nick? Are, yeah, Nick. Say, tell us who you are. Uh, Nick Bosenkett, a uh, retired professor at Imperial College now uh, running a consultancy called Aiming for Health Success, which our uh, general theme is to do a hell of a lot more with what we've got. Um, <clears throat> let's look at the success stories because the whole York, North Yorkshire, Leeds, and Bradford and Manchester areas are beginning to look like a real success story in levelling up through the growth of small firms, incoming pe young people staying rather than moving away, and uh, more, more housing choice in, in various ways. So we've got a real success story there. And I agree with Diane that the, the northern powerhouse rail is absolutely vital. But it should be seen in terms of doing what we can to produce real results in five years rather than doing some fantastic new high-speed rail uh, so that we have something like a reasonable service uh, uh, between uh, Liverpool and Manchester. At the moment, half the trains are cancelled. Uh, so it's completely uh, it, it's completely wrong, but uh, how do we build and generate uh, local initiative for local success? As is happening in that area and beginning to happen to a Teesside, Newcastle. Okay, so a kind of local economic governance type question. I think the gentleman here. Yep. And I'm re I'm a resident of the north. Good. Tell us who you are. Uh, Dan Mawson, Bayes. <clears throat> so one of the things we struggle with in government is some of those big transitions you talk about, like automation, which are highly disruptive. And th thinking back to some of the points people are making about our institutions, how do you build institutions which can handle automation, which does not sit in any way across insensible departmental silos? Uh, we've encountered this when we ask people, and we have patches of policy dotted around government, but they're very hard to link up in a sort of coordinated, coherent way. Okay, any more from the room, or should we come back to the panel? Anyone else wanting to get in now? No, okay, let's, um, Diane, I'll just come to you first on, and just sort of broaden out, if you like, the next question, just to, I mean, how fundamental is a shift in economic power in terms of governance? to your point about breaking, if you like, the treasury stranglehold. Is, that, is the only route to that a fun, kind of a fundamental devolution, which must mean fiscal devolution of power? So I, I would say so. I and mean, as I'm sure everybody knows, we're a very um, politically centralised economy and very politically, very centralised tax and spend as well. It's not entirely clear what the right balance is, but being at one extreme is probably the wrong place. Yeah. So certainly some of that devolution. I, I would sort of link the two questions because I think it's easier to join up in local areas than it is across Whitehall departments. And so tackling some of the transition, I think, could be more effectively done um, because there's a granularity of information at local level about where are the jobs going? What skills do those people have? What are the genuine new opportunities? And um, uh, the sort of coordination among people, uh, including the private business sector as well as, as the public sector, is easier at that local level as well. So I would link the two. And I think there are some good signs in the northern cities, but what's not shifted is um, productivity and income per capita. So graduates staying, um, you know, great city centres, all of that is good but we're not, um, we're not safe yet. Yeah, uh, John, did you want to come in on that? 
Well, holistic policy is is very desirable. Actually, let me recommend the OECD report, Building Back Better, yes. which is a really outstanding yeah. report on exactly this, the importance of integrating policy across a whole range of, of, of departments, um, and not just treasury focused or, or housing focused in a narrow, or transport health focused in a narrow way. Um, how one achieves that? I mean, if one could educate the, the people in the treasury, uh, that might help. Yeah, well, that's <coughs> that's a, a, a larger question. Um, now, I've got a range. Whenever you talk about the, the 1980s, it kind of triggers people, is my experience. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm not going to do justice to all these. But I guess there's a theme here, which is, um, and John, your paper touches on this, but I'll be interested in all your views. So the 90s, no, given the legacy of the 70s and the kind of shifts in technology and shifts in, t in trade, a lot of deindustrialization was going to happen in the 1980s, whatever, is the kind of gist of the questions. Um, so yes, there were, you know, we can all, there were policy mistakes and we can relitigate some of them, but how much of the things that people can kind of define the decade in terms of the, the negatives, if you like, were inevitable and were going to happen regardless of who was in power, and how much was their particular particularly should be owned by the, cho the political choices made. There's is, is, is about three different questions sort of saying, well, basically wasn't most of it's going to happen anyway and there wasn't much any government could have done. I don't want to lose, if we can keep, keep this quite pithy so we can get one more question in. I'll start with you, John, seeing as you wrote the 80s. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, just, just looking at the employment share of manufacturing as, as, or in industry as one indicator, um, it, it's very clear that, you know, with seven and a bit percent of employment in manufacturing, we, we could have at least... 10% now if different policies, if policies more like those pursued by the Netherlands or, or, or Germany or, or France had been adopted in, in the 1980s. So it, it, it has made a longer difference. Um, although, of course, there would have been a decline in any case in the yeah. proportion in manufacturing. Diane? Uh, so <laughs> clearly this is a, a general trend and um, there's some rethinking going on now in economics I think about the wisdom of having gone for the outsourcing global value chains yep. so for various reasons not just the supply shocks but also the recognition of the loss of capacity and know-how um, uh, there. Um, but I, 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 it would be good to get away from thinking about manufacturing and services in this way. Rolls-Royce, major manufacturing company, more than half its revenues come from services yeah, themselves. So, yeah. so let's think instead about what's the high value productive activities and yeah. which are the ones that we, we don't mind losing, but then do much better at helping people uh, transition. Yeah. Vic, on this kind of, how should we view the 80s with hindsight? Well, um, it seems to me that uh, if you were abandoning protectionism, as we essentially did between the, the late 60s yep. and the early 80s, uh, then the deindustrialisation was going to follow. Uh, we had a bloated industrial sector behind those tariff barriers. Uh, but I think one ought to add in, and I think it's in John's paper, the huge shock to manufacturing which oil and the rise in the real exchange rate delivered yeah. uh, in those uh, years in 80 and 81. Um, a lot of that manufacturing employment decline occurred very early in the decade, in fact. Just to come back on that, I mean, Charlie Bean has estimated the effect, the effect of, of so-called Dutch disease, which is the, the oil yeah. effect, and it really is quite a small fraction <coughs> of, of the total decline in manufacturing employment that occurred. Now, <clears throat> we're almost out of time, and I want to turn to the future very briefly. And we've got like two, I oh know, uh, in the last five minutes, we'll talk about the future. Um, we've got a couple of different types of questions about kind of optimism and pessimism, I guess, in terms of thinking about our fundamental challenge and productivity. And let me try to like paraphrase. So one, one version of this is, um, shouldn't we, isn't pessimism just realism in the sense that we are, an aging country, we've used up the kind of low-hanging fruit from universal education some time ago, uh, and we're, you know, overwhelmingly service-dominated, and it's just really hard to generate productivity gains from services compared to manufacturing, etc. So maybe we just need to kind of get a bit more Japanese and a bit more used to living with lower productivity growth and making the best of that. That's kind of one version of it. Another version of this is basically things have been so bad for so long in terms of productivity, like 15 years, that surely that must create this, the kind of 
the preconditions, I guess, for optimism, because we're just so far behind the productivity frontier. <laughs> that, isn't there just, like, catch-up's easier than, than, up, than being at the frontier in terms of actually just being, you know, using other people's technology and innovation? So surely there should be some catch-up possible, given how far behind we have fallen which is a, is, a, is a kind of gloomy form of optimism, if you like. You know, we can actually kind of make up that ground because we're so far behind. Which, where do you sit in terms of, where does, where do, where does this conversation about history make you situate you in terms of levels of optimism or pessimism about the capacity of this country to rekindle productivity growth? Nick, you're the yeah. productivity guru. <laughs> um, I'm quite optimistic that at some point technological progress will deliver. If it's AI and robotics, we're probably better placed than some other countries, though not top of the league. Yep. Uh, the key thing, I think, to focus on uh, as a policymaker is absorptive capacity and achieving rapid diffusion, yep. not trying to invent our own wheel, so to speak. Um, but there always is, it, with these really big GPT-type uh, episodes, there always is a bit of a lag between the excitement of you know start of the technological era and it really showing up in the productivity numbers. Um, all of us are old enough to remember the solo productivity paradox. Yeah. yeah. Diane, where are you on the pessimism, optimism scales? Both. I mean, the pessimist <laughs> pessimistic is um, looking at the OBR report, yeah. uh, the length of the uh, depression in real incomes is just quite staggering, and I don't know what that implies for our politics and society. But the optimism is about um, the technology, including productivity gains and services that they might not be easy to yep. measure, but yep. potential for clean energy, for genomic medicines, for materials, for AI is extraordinary. We do want to use them as much as invent them, but I think actually occupying bits of the frontier, we should do that as well because oh. we can do that. And so that's the, that's the optimistic bit of it. John? Accelerating the, uh, the switch to, to green technology, uh, I think, has huge potential because the, the savings and the benefits for future growth are actually enormous there. Yeah. So that is a happy note uh, for us to wrap up on. Just let's bring up the answers to the poll to find out which decade you think we may most resemble. Can we do that? Uh, the tension. Everyone, so basically, you. <laughs> now, how much of that is because that's what you really think, and how much is because it's being written in the papers every day? That is, that's the real question. But basically, it feels like terms of trade shot, high inflation, and um, uh, we don't even have the music of the 70s. Um, anyway, that's where you're all at. Let me just thank um, our speakers. Uh, I thought they were all fantastic. The papers are brilliant. Please do read them. So. Um, and Thank you to everyone who joined us uh, online. Thank you to everyone in the room. Uh, I should have said at the start, thank you also to the Nuffield Foundation who are generously funding the 2030 economy project. So thanks to them too. Good night now. <laughs>